All right. So hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to another subspecialty virtual morning report. Uh, so today's session is a hematology oncology virtual morning report. And I'm so excited because we have two really um, phenomenal, well, three really phenomenal guests here um, who are going to help make this session happen. So our uh, specialist discussant today is Dr. Laura Huppert. Uh, and she is an assistant professor of medicine and a breast oncologist at UCSF. Um, her interests are mainly in clinical and translational research in breast cancer and medical education. And for those who don't know, she's also the author of Hubbard's Notes, uh, which is such a phenomenal book that you guys should all get. <laughs> uh, so Laura, thank you so much for, for being here today. And I'm just curious if you could share just a little bit about your journey to um, oncology and specifically you know, breast cancer research. Just how did you develop that interest? Yeah, um, so I'm delighted to be here. Thank you so much for the invitation, first of all. Um, and I came to oncology um, sort of circuitously. I think I initially thought I would do ID and then palm and then GI. So for those of you who don't know exactly what you want to do yet, I that is totally okay. Um, but during residency, um, I went to a number of oncology clinics and just sort of fell in love with the longitudinal relationship with patients and um, kind of the rapid rate of advances in the field recently with a lot of new therapies um, and how we're using science and translational research to really you know, bring new drugs to patients. Um, and so kind of because of all those reasons, um, you know, gravitated towards oncology um, and then I like breast cancer, working with um, mostly female patients and um, a lot of really interesting biology with both the hormonal breast-based breast cancers um, and some non-hormonal cancers. So just an interesting area of medicine as well. Um, so really happy to be here. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And um, I think we'd all love to get to know you a little bit better. Could you share a little bit of um, like an interest that you have outside of medicine? Sure. Yeah. Um, I uh, am very into sports and the outdoors, and I rode um, in college um, uh, on the crew team. Um, so I've been a rower for my whole life, and um, it's a very big, you know, passion of mine, and a big reason that um, I, you know, am where I am because I feel like it teaches you all of the, you know, teamwork and hard work, and and a lot of really good um, values that have made me who I am. So I um, love rowing and love um, other sports as well. Awesome. Well, thank you again so much for, for being here. Um, and our other specialist discussant is um, Dr. Vipul Kumar, who is a HEMOC fellow at UCSF. Uh, so thank you also so much for being here. And I was wondering if you could also unmute, um, you know, share a little bit about your, your journey to HEMOC and also something outside of medicine that you enjoy. Awesome. No problem. Uh, I think Laura uh, said it best. And I think one thing I'll emphasize is that it's okay to have like tons of interests and find your way and whatever path you do. Cause that certainly was me. I came also to it circuitously. So I got left behind to do my PhD. So I did an MD and a PhD and I was exposed to the field of oncology during my PhD. Actually, I studied genomic instability. I was always scared of oncology. Everybody told me, Oh, it's where people go and they pass away this, that, and the next. And then I realized that, that people just didn't know what they were talking about. And like Laura, I really, went into oncology clinics in my third and fourth year in medical school to really explore and see what it was about. And I think it's, there's no field that was more exciting to me uh, than that in terms of new breakthroughs and things that were happening with patients. And so I went to medicine residency specifically with an eye towards becoming an oncologist because I felt like it was just a terrific place where science, ethics, you know, public health, everything all intersects and things were happening uh, in such a really rich uh, and collaborative way. So not too dissimilar from Laura, but um, I was, again, I was initially scared off and then came, came back to it. Um, and so if that's you in the audience, then you're not alone. Um, what do I like doing outside of uh, so, so many things, um, which is why SF is great. I also like playing sports. I'm an avid tennis fan, both playing and watching. So for those of you who like tennis and have seen Federer, who's my favorite player, uh, retire, um, it's been really tough uh, for me, but also an inspiration. Um, and I like to share those things with my wife. So I'm, you know, married, um, we live here. So yeah, that's me. Amazing. Thank you so much for, for being here. Mm -hmm. And, um, Andrew, I don't think you need any introduction, but, um, Andrew will be our incredible case presenter. And Andrew, do you want to just unmute and share something, um, share something fun about yourself? He's a PGY2 at Yale. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm Andrew PGY2, not a hematologist oncologist. I always feel like that. It's always uh, beyond my my scope. Every time I'm on service, I'm very much confused by all the oncology plan. When I when I move to the plan section on inpatient, I, I just say like chemo. That's my plan for for my tumors. Um, in, in any case, no, I love a general medicine. I'm applying into a hospital's career next year. Um, and I love diagnosis um, as evident in this case, I'm going to share with you. This is a really fantastic case I came across on the inpatient service of our hematology oncology service here at Yale. So I'm excited to share it with you. Awesome. Well, um, uh, Deborah, you can go ahead and, and share your screen and just a shout out to Deborah who will be scribing and McCoon who will be doing teaching points. Um, so whenever Deborah shares your screen, um, Andrew, feel free to dive into the first aliquot. Sounds good. Uh, so I did share these aliquots with Deborah already, so I can talk as fast as I want, which is nice. Um, let me just get myself set up here. Uh, okay, so this first aliquot will be kind of the left two boxes on the screen. I'll go through chief concern, HPI, and past medical, et cetera. So this was the case of an active, healthy man in his 80s, and he presented to our hospital with worsening dyspnea on exertion and dry cough exacerbated when supine and on his right side, like lying on his right side. So while he was at an outdoor high school football match recently in the wintertime, he felt chilly. He had to get in his car, but he denied fever, severe rigors, or speed in production. Prior to this presentation, he was really quite active. In fact, he'd climbed Mount Kilimanjaro only a few years ago, despite his age. So this was quite impressive in terms of his like prior baseline exercise tolerance. Um, he also didn't notice any significant extremity or abdominal swelling, chest pain on exertion or at rest or other symptoms. So he elected to come to the oncology urgent clinic as the dyspnea on exertion was pretty concerning to him. So for his past medical history, he had a remote nine pack year smoking history. He otherwise only had metastatic melanoma with subcutaneous metastasis. It was one met total and a left upper lobe lung metastasis, which was biopsy confirmed earlier that year. And uh, moving on to the oncology, I can't move on without this. Um, so analysis of the tumor tissue revealed no evidence of BRAF or NRAS gene mutations, there was an activating mutation in CKIT. He'd recently had cycle seven of pembrolizumab monotherapy. He had no known drug allergies. He was on a benzodiazepine sleep aid. He had no prior chest surgery or radiation, and he did not have any other toxic habits. That's the first aliquot. All right, so a lot of information already. Um, Laura, I'm curious, you know, what's going through your mind when um, you're hearing this information? Great, thank you so much. Um, so just to, I guess, put in as a one-liner, this is an 80-year-old gentleman with a history of metastatic melanoma on pembrolizumab, who's coming in with um, dyspnea on exertion and a dry cough. Um, and so I think um, the things that are going through my mind, um, so I guess first let's let's just talk briefly about um, metastatic melanoma to make sure everyone's on the same page. Um, so melanoma, um, as you know, is a skin cancer that um, can is typically a cutaneous lesion that spreads, although there's um, also, you know, you can have a, a mucosal melanoma, which is from the lining of the GI tract or even a, muc a melanoma that stems from your eye. Um, so there's different subtypes of melanoma, but most likely this is a cutaneous melanoma. And um, in the past, metastatic melanoma, you know, was you know, almost uniformly fatal. We didn't have very good agents to treat them. It didn't respond well to chemotherapy, um, but immunotherapy has come to, um, you know, fruition now that in around 2011, um, we have these new agents called um, PD-1 and PD-L1 inhibitors, um, and pembrolizumab is a PD-1 inhibitor. And basically, the goal of these immunotherapy agents is to use the body's own immune system to help fight cancer. And so we're basically revving up the body's own immune system to um, attack the cancer cells, um, you know, in a more efficient way. And now metastatic melanoma, we can actually now more or less cure. We can have long-term survivors of metastatic melanoma with, you know, single agent immunotherapy like this. 
The challenge is with immunotherapy, as most of you probably know, is that sometimes instead of fighting the cancer, it can fight the body's own cells and cause autoimmune type side effects. And so whenever anyone's been on immunotherapy recently, um, you always have to think about IRAEs. Um, and so in terms of thinking about a differential for this gentleman, um, you know, worsening dyspnea on exertion, dry cough, um, of course, you're thinking about all of the typical things that cause um, dyspnea on exertion and dry cough outside of oncology. You never want to miss those. You know, everyone can have, you know, a heart attack or a pneumonia or any other, you know, broader differential. But within the more oncology focused differential, um, I'm typically thinking of, could this be disease progression or, you know, could his melanoma be getting worse where he's having, you know, more plural effusions or buildup of cancer cells in the, in the chest, um, or could it be a complication of his therapy? Um, and so thinking about immune related adverse events related to the melanoma or related to the pembrolizumab. Um, so you can get pneumonitis, um, which is basically inflammation of the lungs. Um, you can get um, myocarditis or myositis. Um, so, you know, inflammation of the heart or the muscle. Um, and so all of these things um, should be going through your head. Um, so basically um, cancer related progression of disease versus, um, you, know, you know, problems from the treatments that we're giving to the patient. I don't know, Vipul, what you feel free to add anything at all. No, that was super comprehensive. You covered all of immunotherapy and, and, and one thing and all the IREs. I think I just echo that we have a biased lens and I would want to make sure that medicine things being common, that we also think about the, the classic dyspion exertion um, sort of differential as well on top of that. That's all. Yeah. And one other thing, um, pulmonary embolisms, as you know, are more common in patients with cancer. And so rise a little bit higher on the um, shortness of breath differential. Yeah, that was really just a phenomenal discussion. I think what, what really stands out to me is you're using, you know, this background of melanoma and I like kind of the different buckets you taught us, you know, is this a progression of that disease? Is it immune related related to the therapy or kind of separately from uh, kind of the cancer focused um, thought and just um, thinking that, you know, could this be one of the, the other types of differentials we think of with dyspnea? So uh, really phenomenal teaching there. Uh, Andrew, you can give us the next alpha. Sounds good. So. For the vital signs, he was afebrile, uh, and when he initially presented this initial presentation, everything else was normal. He didn't require any oxygen, and he was normocardic, normal breathing rates. So for the physical, it was really just remarkable for crackles at his right lung base, trace edema midway up his shins bilaterally. He had a JVP that was elevated to the mandibular angle with the head of the bed at 45 degrees. And moving on to his initial labs, he had a hyponatremia to 129, a K of 4, bicarb of 25, BUN of 12, creatinine of 0 0.9, normal glucose. He had a white count of 9.3, uh, hemoglobin of 12, platelets of 317. He had an AST of 46, ALT of 34, ALKFOS of 226. T Billy of 0 0.9, albumin of 3.2, a NT Pro BNP of 5,800, a ProCal of 0 0.08, that's in nanograms per mil, and a high sensitivity CRP of 183.5 mg per liter. And I have kind of serial imaging to show you later on in the case. Um, so you'll get some more later because this is kind of a sequential case kind of how I saw it in real time. So I'm just going to pull up his initial chest x-ray for this initial presentation. And I actually haven't met him at this point yet. Um, so give me one moment. I'm just going to share my screen here. Um, this is his initial chest x-ray when he comes into the clinic. And I'll give you, I'll give you the read in a moment here. Let me get out of this. So the read was um, unilateral uh, patchy airspace opacities involving all three right lung lobes. And that's the end of the solid quad. All right, so I, Warren, we'll jump to you again. And um, what's going, through your mind right now with this additional information, how it affects the differential. 
I was, I am um, Dibble and I were texting and I said he could go first this time. So we'll just switch. Oh, around. great. Yeah. Sounds great. Um, yeah, thanks. This is great. Uh, can you remind myself? He has no oxygen requirement, right? No oxygen requirement. Okay. Well, broad things, just more basically, I'd like to just know if he had a baseline chest x-ray. So I assume that all these findings are new. I would like to compare it to a prior one. Okay, great. Um, well, I think Again, we're still in the bucket of being undifferentiated. I think that uh, one of the things that we talked about was something structural that I think about like solid tumors in particular, is it pushing on something? Because you mentioned that his JVP was also elevated. So is there something compressing against his superior vena cava causing something you know, to go up? Um, uh, it sounds like that's not necessarily uh, what we're seeing. He has a diffuse process in one lung. When we think about the word pneumonitis that uh, Dr. Huppert had mentioned too, Usually, it manifests as something called grand, ground glass opacities, and they're usually bilaterally or multilobar. So, but a unilateral lung is not like slam dunk for what this is. So, um, to be honest, I'm a little bit uh, stumped right now. Um, one question I have for you Does this gentleman have prior echoes um, from a heart perspective uh, as well, or any cardiac history? No cardiac history. I don't think he had any prior echoes, and you'll get one in a second too for this new presentation. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. So I think right now what I'm thinking is, is that I, I think everything is still kind of on the differential, including infection and some other things. I think it is striking if he doesn't have history of heart failure or elevated right-sided pressures that he would have an elevated JVP, uh, as you mentioned. So um, yeah, that's what I'm thinking about. So what do you think, Laura? I totally agree. I think um, the elevated GVP, um, the crackles at the lung base, the edema is all screaming volume overload. And so is it, are you thinking, you know, cardiac issue? Could this be a potential, you know, sometimes you think about renal issues or liver issues also causing edema, you know, his creatinine's normal, his LFTs are normal. So um, makes me lean more towards cardiac issues um, being the cause of, you know, his volume overload, but we'll need more information. Um, so then the question is why? Is he having heart failure from an, you know, reason unrelated to his oncology, you know, he's an elderly gentleman, could he have had an MI um, or, you know, viral myocarditis, you know, certainly thinking common things being common um, or then related to his cancer, could this be a myocarditis from his um, pembrolizumab and IRAE, like we said before, um, could he have a large PE causing right heart strain, um, you know, ultimately leading to heart failure like symptoms? Um, I think, um, those are the kind of the things I would like to add. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I, one, one question that that's come up is, um, so you've talked about kind of the immune related effects you can get from pembrolizumab. I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit more like for that drug specifically, what are some of the, you know, immune related effects that um, are most common? Yeah. So um, I don't know. Do you want to take this one double? Yeah. And I think Dr. Hupper, pembrolizumab in particular, I think it's um, uh, helpful to think about just checkpoint inhibitor toxicity more broadly. Um, but I think Laura began to mention some of those things, but classic things that are sort of easy for all of us to see maybe in the ED or on the inpatient service are things like dermatitis. So a rash uh, that can develop colitis. So meaning any sort of belly stuff. So if you are suspecting anything, um, abdominal pain, bloody diarrhea, that kind of stuff is unfortunately fairly common for those who do have an effect. Hypothyroidism uh, is another uh, common thing. Um, in more rare cases, in, in the bucket of endocrinopathies, adrenal insufficiency uh, can also happen. And then there's more of the rare stuff. So the pneumonitis, the myocarditis, which can be life-threatening, uh, as well as hypophysitis uh, in the brain. So I like to think about it as like anything that can be attacked by your T cells um, has the ability to have an itis associated with it. That's how I kind of explain it to patients. And so... Um, it might be worth just knowing for this patient if it's on a differential, are, is, has he had a pr prior history of immune-related adverse events or IRAEs? Uh, and if so, what has been done about them and, you know, et cetera. Um, yeah, I totally agree. I think two other like important teaching points is you don't actively have to be on one of these drugs to get an IRE. Even months later, you can develop an IRE related to the immune dysfunction. And so you really should keep IREs on your differential for even up to a year after they've received um, any of the um, these agents. Um, and the other thing is um, if someone's had, like people mentioned, an IRE before, um, if they're re-challenged, they're higher likelihood of getting a second IRE or a third IRE. 
Um, and similarly, if you note that they have one IRA, you should really be thinking, are they having others at the same time? And so looking for things like checking their TSH, checking their cortisol, these are, these are ones that are more easily missed, um, like adrenal insufficiency or hypothyroidism. Um, so if someone does have, you know, colitis, you should be thinking, should I be checking these other labs to look for other IREs that could be co-occurring? Amazing. Thank you both. Um, all right, Andrew, we can move on to the next aliquot. Okay, this is uh, this is wonderful. I'm excited for you to get the next two aliquots. Okay, so the next aliquot is um, the respiratory virus panel and SARS-CoV-2 testing were negative. He gets two blood cultures that were negative, and he had a very brief admission for this. He was empirically treated for community-acquired pneumonia with a five-day course of cefuroxy and mendoxy with improvement of symptoms. He was given Lasix for peripheral edema, an echo was acquired. It showed normal left ventricular systolic and diastolic function, moderate mitral regurge, and mild aortic stenosis. So he was subsequently discharged. Now, 18 days after discharge, he came back to our oncology clinic, basically with recurrence of his symptoms. A chest x-ray showed a new pleural effusion and interval increase in the right-sided lung opacities. Um, he was prescribed another five-day course of levofloxacin at that time to cover again for CAP. However, his symptoms persisted again. So on day five of levofloxacin, he was readmitted, which is actually when I meet him in the hospital. And let me show you his chest x-ray when he came to the hospital this time. One moment. So here's his new chest x-ray. And again, he was briefly hospitalized, got the CAP treatment. 18 days later, he had the um, recurrence of his symptoms, got five days of uh, a quinolone, respiratory quinolone treatment again, but continued to get worse and worse. So he comes in with this chest x-ray now. So I'll just stop there and let the board come back up. Do you mind making me co-host? I think I'm going to share the screen. Sure, give me one second. All right. And if, do you have any more information for this aliquot or should we jump to the discussion? That's it for this aliquot. Okay. And there's going to be um, another one after this before the reveal. OK, perfect. Uh, so Laura, I guess we'll jump to you first. And I'm curious what you make of this kind of progression of the patient's symptoms and um, any changes you notice in the chest x-ray. You're muted. Oh, Laura, I think you're muted. Oh, thank you. Sorry. <laughs> um, I was going to say, just to summarize, so we had had the initial chest x-ray um, that looked um, fairly wet, um, but, um, you know, was relatively clear compared to the second one, which showed the new pleural effusion. Um, after the first one, they had given him empiric treatment for pneumonia. Um, I can't tell you how common it is that, um, you know, if this is an IRE, this would be a very common story where, you know, we're, we're, if you're not familiar diagnosing IREs, it's really common to, you know, be treated for a pneumonia first or be treated for something else first. And then it takes a little while for someone to think of it and work it up and, and come to that conclusion. Um, so, you know, I think it's not unreasonable potentially that they thought about a pneumonia first, but this is a gentleman who, given his treatment history, um, you know, we really would have wanted to watch him really closely because if that wasn't working to, you know, broaden our differential and think um, more holistically about him. Um, but now certainly I'm concerned that his pleural effusion is worsening um, and he's not feeling better. Um, whenever anyone has a new pleural effusion that's never been tapped, I'd recommend um, sampling that um, to um, see a whether there are tumor cells there, whether this is a malignant effusion, um, or whether you know there are other um, bacteria or other you know whether it's a um, uh, empyema would be a concern um, that there's actually bacteria there that we need to drain it to get source control. Um, so we would definitely want to sample the effusion. Um, and then I think we're still in the same situation that we don't know what's causing his, you know, volume overload and um, his, um, uh, you know, worsening symptoms here. I don't know if we've looked at his heart yet. I would definitely want to get an echo, um, you know, potentially um, check troponins on him if we're concerned for myocarditis as well. 
Um, I don't know if he's had a proper CT scan. It looks like we've just had chest x-rays at this point, um, but I think I would want to do um, several of these additional tests to try to hone in on what might be causing his symptoms. Yeah. Did pull anything else? Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I was, a, I wanted to emphasize the last point. I think uh, chest x-rays are a good start and just doing a one view at a minimum getting a PA and a lateral can always help you because you can identify masses or other views that you can't. But if you have access to a CT scanner, at a minimum, people like this should be getting a non-con uh, CT of the chest because you can get really good resolution of the parenchyma. Um, and in fact, even without contrast, some lymph nodes. One thing I wanted to share with you all, I, I tell interns is an acronym I made up for hypoxemic respiratory failure, but I think it applies to dyspnea and kind of lung stuff in general in a really broad sense is like this, this thing called VIT, so volume, is one cause infection, which they've been treated for inflammatory, which is really broad, like, you know, reactive airways disease, or potentially like something like a, a pneumonitis and T is thrombus, um, which is something that we also haven't yet done. And so if that's helpful for you guys uh, in the future, that's um, uh, something that I like to put on my little checklist of lung related uh, pathology. I would love to get a non-con at least uh, CT chest with a diagnostic tap of the, of the pleural fusion to, to know what's going on. Yeah, really, fa really phenomenal discussion. Um, you mentioned that you know, you're, it's still in your differential that this could be an immune-related adverse effect. Adverse effect, um, if I'm understanding you correctly. And I was wondering if you could talk us through, you know, how you actually make that diagnosis. Is it ultimately a diagnosis of exclusion, or how would you come to to make that diagnosis? Yeah, it's a great question, and um, it is challenging because it is, as you said, a diagnosis of exclusion for both um, pneumonitis and myocarditis, and so. Um, for myocarditis, it's ruling out, uh, you know, viral causes, if possible, ruling out um, ACS, um, you know, whether someone's had um, acute coronary syndrome, and then in the right clinical context, if you've ruled out these more common things, um, then you can ultimately come to, you know, a conclusion that it might be an IRA myocarditis. Similarly for, similarly for a pneumonitis, I'm ruling out other common causes and coming to that diagnosis. There's not one specific diagnostic test though that can, you know, clinch either of these diagnoses. Yeah. And to build on that, you know, we, we, as oncologists rely on the national comprehensive cancer network guidelines, the NCCN guidelines. And one of the things that it says, which is not necessarily adopted by everybody is to get a bronchoscopy, for example, um, to rule out other things where you are able to visually look at the airways get a, put some fluid down there, get a lavage, um, to again, really rule out infection or things that you're not used to things like tuberculosis, et cetera. Um, and so that could be part of something in a way to arrive at the diagnosis of pneumonitis. Um, in the NCCN, just as a plug, um, you can get a free, um, login as a trainee. And so any of you are, who are interested in looking at guidelines for things like IREs or really any um, cancer guidelines, I would definitely recommend checking it out. That's our sort of um, comprehensive guidelines across cancer types. All right. Thank you both. Okay, Andrew, I think we can jump to the next aisle Okay. Um, I have some answers for your questions. Uh, we got repeat blood cultures that were negative. Uh, urine antigen testing for pneumococcus and Legionella is negative. His basic labs are roughly unchanged. Uh, he gets a chest tube. So on the uh, chest X-ray, it basically had showed a hydro-pneumothorax, so both a pleural effusion and a pneumothorax. So we had pulmonology come and uh, insert a chest tube at admission. So these are the results of his pleural fluid studies. So he had greater than 15,000 nucleated cells per microliter of which 48% were granulocytes, 5% were lymphocytes, and 2% were eosinophils. Uh, although the right lung re-expanded on subsequent chest x-rays, he had persistent right-sided lung opacification and dyspnea on exertion after three days of zosin therapy, which prompted a BAL. So he did get his bronch, you'll ask for. Uh, the BAL showed 435 nucleated cells per microliter with 73% lymphocytes, 11% granulocytes, and 2% eosinophils. There were no malignant cells or organisms demonstrated in either the pleural or the BAL fluid. And that's all the information before the final diagnosis.
All right, so maybe we'll start with you, uh, Vithal, and you know, maybe you can walk us through how the uh, data from the pleural fluid and the BAL is impacting your differential. Yeah, uh, it's a good question. I have to remind myself always of Light's criteria, but I, remind me with the LDH and all the other stuff, is this an exudative effusion, uh, Andrew? Oh, shoot. I actually, I don't even have like all the lights criteria um, data in front of me. Off the no top worries. Of my head, I don't recall. I'm going to pretend it's actually data for a second. I, I, I assume so. That That is step one for me when I sort of just think about because there's different causes of transudative versus exudative. But, and then I want to confirm, um, there's two types of tests that you can send on fluids. One is something called cytology. Cytology is great for uh, like kind of you spin out cells, make a cell block, and you stain the cells, look at morphology and surface markers. So Andrew, I assume cytology was on. Is that correct? The, the other thing... Huh? Oh, sorry. Yeah, cytology was done, and there were no malignant cells. And there. sorry, I'm trying to... I'm going to pull up light. Yeah, no worries, no worries. And then the other thing that people can do if they have a high enough suspicion, for example, if it was a different story, somebody had diffuse adenopathy, so like lots of lymph nodes, other things, is a test called flow cytometry, where we can take the cells and run them through something called a flow cytometer and do a cell surface staining in mass of like thousands of cells to look for things like lymphoma cells or leukemia cells. And I assume, Andrew, that that probably was not done. Is that correct? Uh, off the top of my head, I don't recall either. And sorry, I was I was perfectly listening. Flow for uh, lymphoma is that is that the question? Yeah, it's it's good for it's good in particular for blood based cancers in which you know you might have let's say for example Hodgkin's lymphoma can sometimes present with a new exudated pleural effusion, uh, and so sometimes a flow cytometry sent on the fluid. Um, so even if you don't see it by cytology, like with the it, you might pick something on flow. So that's just off the cuff some things that I was thinking about. Um, and then I assume, let's see here, for the, they're mostly, it's granulocyte predominant. So yeah, I'm assuming that the pH was probably normal. I like to look at pH only because if it's pH, I think less than 7.2, it has high sensitivity for predicting an empyema, uh, which if this guy had empyema, we would be really sick. Um, and yeah, I don't know. I'm not, I don't know if I know exactly what the diagnosis is based on this. What about you, Laura? What do you think? Yeah, I'm with you. It helps. I mean, if we were able to, you know, rule out an empyema, if the pH were, um, as you said, um, normal, and then if, you know, we're ruling out, there's no cancer in that fluid, et cetera. I think it's helping us rule out some things, but I don't think it necessarily brings us to a diagnosis um, based on this data. Yeah. And one thing I, I wanted to ask you guys is there's been you know quite a lot of information thrown our way and um you know a progression of the kind of the patient's disease over several days and I'm I'm curious how you're kind of framing the whole case in your mind like what is what are kind of the pertinent details here or how are you framing the the patient yeah I mean I think um you know this is a gentleman 80 year old with metastatic melanoma um on pembrolizumab who's coming in with um, dyspnea exertion and worsening cough um, with imaging showing um, you know initially some evidence of volume overload um, however you know not responding to antibiotics and now with evidence of worsening volume overload um, so I think that would be my one-liner for this gentleman um, I think in, in thinking of in terms of his disease um, Patients with metastatic melanoma, we can treat with either single agent immunotherapy, or sometimes we'll treat with double, like ipi nevo, where it's PD-1 and CTLA-4. Based on the description of his prior disease, it didn't sound like he had a great burden of disease. Um, and typically for metastatic melanoma, I wouldn't expect a cancer to necessarily progress so, so rapidly like this. So I'm thinking, I think it's less like could certainly be his disease progressing, um, but over a course of a week for it to get so much worse um, where he was, you know, hiking two weeks ago and now this um, on treatment um, is this a little bit unusual. Um, so I'm thinking more likely a complication of his therapy or a non-oncologic um, cause. Um, mel melanoma in general can be very aggressive. Um, there, there would be additional you know, information we'd need. We'd need a PET scan or some other systemic imaging to get a sense of his burden of disease, look at his LDH, look at his um, you know, tumor markers. Sometimes these 
tumors can be such that they're even lysing. I haven't yet heard evidence of, of that kind of picture for this gentleman. Um, so assuming it's not rapidly progressive melanoma, I think thinking of um, either you know a complication of his therapy that's not improving or a non-oncologic cause. Yeah, really, really masterful discussion. Thank you both. Um, I'm curious before Andrew gives us a bit more information, if there was like, what would you do at this point to further work up the patient? I don't know if both of you want to go first. Yeah, I mean, I think I've been thinking about this all along. I, I kind of wanted to know what his most recent, when Laura was talking about this burden of his disease. We call those the technical terms called staging scans. So we get surveillance scans to sort of keep, you know, an idea of what they are. So he's already, it sounds like he's stage four because he's metastatic, but I would like to know if we've gotten a recent CT chest, abdomen, pelvis with contrast, for example, even during this hospitalization to get an idea if like, if the rest of his disease is really getting, you know, crazy, um, could we map that on to what's going on in his lungs? So that's just more of a curiosity as to um, what it could be. Um, and I think that um, it sounds like we've ruled out a lot of other things. And if we've got, let's say, a cardiologist and a pulmonologist who also uh, is on board, is there a way we can get tissue? Or is one of the things that I'm thinking about too. And have we really ruled out some of the more funky indolent organisms? Um, I don't see that he might have risk factors for things like, um, you know, TB or anything like that. But I assume that the fluid's been sent for acid fast standing and things like that. So that's kind of where I might go next. And I'm also presuming that he still does not have an oxygen requirement remarkably. Is that true? Remarkably, all he had was one, two liters at a time, and it was rapidly uh, decreased remarkably. Yeah, well. He, again, he, he had hiked some out Kilimanjaro only a few years prior, so he's in pretty good shape. He had a very good reserve. Yeah. And, you know, I think that if if that's the case and and we've really thought through that he doesn't have a clear infection and usually it's reasonable to involve our infectious disease colleagues in cases just like this and, and whatnot. And, and we really can't find a structural cause based on like, a, it's like a tumor that's causing like obstruction leading to like stuff, you know, it, you know, if, I have to refresh myself, but it might be reasonable to consider a trial of immunosuppression. Although it, I think again, he's got a radiographic finding and some symptoms, but not necessarily the oxygen requirement. So, um, I'm, I'm a little hedging there. I'm more curious what Laura thinks. Yeah, I mean, I agree. I think um, it would be very helpful to get a sense of his disease burden with a scan like the bull said. And that um, also, I think if we are concerned about pneumonitis, there are certain features of his imaging that, you know, looking for ground glass opacities that would lead us more towards thinking of, is this a pneumonitis of the lungs? I think I haven't yet heard whether he's had troponins drawn um, and, typically myocarditis from IREs, you will see an elevation of their troponins and would want to, you know, get an EKG, of course. Um, I, I don't know if we've heard that as well. So um, ruling out um, cardiac, um, you know, ACS and, and other causes. But then um, if we do think of myocarditis is on the differential, um, ultimately for these um, itises, um, like Vipple said, an empiric course of steroids um, should cause improvement. Um, in the NCCN guidelines, both pneumonitis and myocarditis, you're typically starting with pretty high doses of IV steroids. These patients should be admitted to the hospital, home or cardiology should be consulted. We're watching them really closely um, because if we aren't seeing improvement with IV steroids, we're adding on secondary immunosuppressive agents. Um, these can be fatal complications of these therapies. And so both pneumonitis and myocarditis, we have to watch these patients extremely closely. Yeah, and jumping off of that, um, Alex meant, uh, put a really great comment in the chat, which is how you know common or uncommon would it be to see unilateral pneumonitis from from cancer? You mean? Yeah, exactly. Um, it depends. I think you know malignancies. We definitely can see unilateral um, pneumonitis, but more often we're seeing bilateral pneumonitis. Um, I think, yeah, we, if we definitely would want to, these are cases where we, you know, get a CT, sometimes even a high resolution chest CT. If we have access to that, we want to go over it with our radiologist really closely, um, to kind of get a better sense of the differential. I um, mean, typically it is, um, bilateral, but anything is really possible. Okay. Um, 
Andrew, I think we can jump to the uh, the next piece of data you have. Okay, so let me wrap this up for you all. And to answer your question, I did some digging. Um, I'd forgotten the, the details. So he had a PET scan, a staging PET scan after the initiation of maybe cycle four or so of his PEMBRO and that left upper lobe nodule had actually fully resolved on the PET scan, it seemed. And he had an MRI brain around that time that was negative. And there was your question about the CT chest. There was only one CT chest done. I, I didn't show it because it was after the chest tube was placed. So it actually didn't provide us too much diagnostic data as his lung was already collapsed. So every, anything that looked like consolidation, it was just like atelectatic lung from the hydropneumothorax. So that's why I didn't show that. Um, and just going back to his history, um, so that original history that was posted um, on the screen share here, that's really all he told me when I meet him on nights. He, he's like, yeah, I, you know, I'm just really worried that I can't breathe as I used to. Like I was this healthy guy and I really, I don't, I don't know what's going on. He was just completely flabbergasted at how he felt. And that's why he was so concerned. And, you know, I, we all saw the huge opacification or rather me and my resident, we were alone that night. And it really looked like a pneumonia. I'm like, so like, what else has been going on with you? And he, he's like, I mean, really, I have this cough, but nothing's really come up. I haven't had any fevers. Um, this chills episode of him going in the car, it sounded more like he just kind of got cold at the high school football game. So he wasn't really giving me a, a good story for pneumonia. Um, so that's when I admitted him. And um, he got a couple days of Zosin, as I mentioned, and he failed to improve, which is why he got the BAL. Um, and at admission, just based off of history, the really negative procalcitonin he had with the discordant high CRP, I just told the primary team, consider pneumonitis. Um, and I looked it up. It's my first time seeing anything like this. And I, I saw multifocal findings, most common. But I still told the team, like the history, it doesn't really make much sense. So I think you all should evaluate if he doesn't get better and he didn't get better. Um, so they gave me a lot of pushback, but they got a transbronchial biopsy and it showed uh, minimal inflammatory changes of the interstitium airways and a possible focus of fibroblastic tissue consistent with organizing pneumonia. So given a negative infectious workup, failure to improve on antibiotics and the entire clinical picture, he was ultimately felt to have immune checkpoint inhibitor pneumonitis secondary to pembrolizumab. So he got prednisone, 60 milligrams a day. The antibiotics were stopped. This is the radiographic progression he had on the prednisone. Um, I don't know, can you see all three images? Yeah, it looks good. So he gets his chest tube and then he basically has clearance of the opacification. Um, those final findings are taken at discharge at clinic. Um, unfortunately, he unexpectedly passed as an outpatient out of nowhere a couple of weeks later. Um, but uh, this, someone asked, uh, unilateral pneumonitis, how common is this? This is pretty case reportable in terms of this degree of pneumonitis on one side and severity. In fact, this is gonna be out in the Brown Journal of Medicine in about a month, I'm publishing this with the oncologist who was on board on this case, um, but I'll just stop there. That's a lot of information. And I think your thought process accurately reflected the thought process of the, the team. Um, it was just so hard to not consider this pneumonia given the imaging and the, the objective findings, but the clinical picture ultimately didn't add up at the end. And as you two suggested, um, really the course of time uh, told the patient story. Yeah, and I also want to comment that I. We usually don't necessarily get a transbronchial biopsy, but I think I'm, I feel a little bit validated. I don't know if you do, Laura, that I was like, let's get some tissue to help clarify because it was confusing, uh, to be honest. <laughs> and so th the fact that it's case reportable, um, yeah, I mean, unilateral, that's that threw me off too. Because I think I agree with Laura, I was thinking about a bilateral pneumonitis. So, um, yeah. wow, what a case. Yeah, I mean, Andrea, I think that's an incredible case. And I think um, your your sense of intuition that this doesn't feel like a pneumonia is often kind of how these things feel is people are, you know, getting sicker, they're not responding to antibiotics, there's something amiss. And I think it's thinking about could this be an IRE and putting that in your differential. Um, because there is no one test that can lead us to that diagnosis, it really is you know, our clinical suspicion and intuition and kind of ruling out other things as you did really elegantly. So I think kudos to you and your team for that. 
Um, I think answering a few questions in the chat that I think are really excellent questions. Um, how does steroids influence the oncologic outcome? Um, so the, the challenge is when we do treat with steroids in these cases, you're basically um, stopping the effects of the immunotherapy. And so we are in oncology very thoughtful about using steroids in these patients, systemic steroids, because we, in this case, you know, we need to, you know, stop the pneumonitis or in cases of myocarditis, the more serious IREs, we're always using high dose steroids, but the unfortunate consequence is that then the, it, you know, it's not working as well to fight the cancer either. So in patients that have um, more minor IREs, we're sometimes trying to get away with topical steroids or less doses of systemic steroids. Um, so I think the one um, takeaway from, for your guys' perspective is in, in these patients on PD-1 and PD-L1 inhibitors, I'm really thoughtful uses of steroids. You know, we need to use them when we need to use them, um, but we don't try to use them willy nilly because um, it does, you know, reduce the efficacy of, of the anti-cancer effect. Um, and then regarding the question of re-challenging with um, immunotherapy after IREs, um, our guidelines have um, evolved over the years, um, but we can rechallenge in more minor IREs. Um, so sometimes more minor colitis, more minor dermatitis. Um, they're graded grade one through four. And so grade one and grade two IREs, um, we often are able to. This would be a grade likely three pneumonitis. And so we probably would not rechallenge this gentleman um, because the risk of this happening again would be so high that um, it would be quite dangerous for him. Um, there are cases of pneumonitis grade one and two in particular, where we do try to rechallenge. Um, it sort of depends on what our other options are too. If someone has very high burden of disease and immunotherapy is working really well, and we don't have many other options, you know, we're kind of between a rock and a hard place. And sometimes we will rechallenge um, versus if we have other options, um, we won't. Um, so that's kind of how I approach that question. Yeah, I'm really just um, blown away by the teaching. I feel like I know I uh, have just learned so much about um, immune-related adverse effects from this um, from this case and from your discussion. So really, thank you both so much. Um, you you answered the question about would you reintroduce this? I'm curious. You know, unfortunately, this patient did pass away. But if he um, if he hadn't, would what type of um, immunotherapy would you consider changing the person to? Yeah. So um, unfortunately, with immunotherapy we think of it as a class-wide effect where I wouldn't necessarily try one of the other agents either because I would similarly be concerned about an IRE. Um, I don't believe, you know, this gentleman, so if for melanoma, one of the other targeted therapy agents we have are BRAF targeted therapies. So we use BRAF inhibitors and MEK inhibitors. About 60% of melanomas are BRAF positive. Um, and so that is a really nice option for patients. If they do have an IRE, um, on immunotherapy. If they do have a BRAF mutation, we'll try that. Um, this gentleman, I think you had said, had a CKIT mutation. We don't usually use a matinib in melanoma, um, but sometimes we can use other targeted agents. We have NRAS inhibitors. Um, so it would be looking at his mutational profile and seeing if we have targeted agents um, that would be options. But it is really tough. In those patients that don't have mutations, that have a bad IRE, um, we were pretty limited in our options. All right. And um, Vipul, I just wanted to turn to you to see if you had any last reflections before we um, jump to teaching points. No, nothing to add. This was a okay. terrific case all around. Yeah, well, thank you again, both of you, for your incredible discussion. And Andrew, really a phenomenal case presentation. Uh, McCoon, we'll turn it to you to take us away with teaching points. Yeah, let's run through this summary. I learned a ton. A lot of this was totally new to me. So thank you so much for all the learning. Um, we started by discussing uh, metastatic melanoma as an entity. We learned that it's a classically a skin cancer, typically cutaneous, but can rarely manifest as mucosal or ocular, um, and that the uh, preferred treatment nowadays is immunotherapy, such as pembrolizumab, which this patient was on, which is a PD-1 inhibitor. Um, have a little bit of information here about PD-1 and PDL one cell surface interactions, um, and what they do, why they're important, um, uh, the, the means by which they inhibit uh, T cell action, essentially. Um, and we also learned later on that 60% uh, of melanomas are BRAF mutation positive, and so treatment can target this mutation in particular. We went on to an extensive discussion of immune-related adverse events, IRAEs, um, in this case, talking about dermatitis, colitis, pneumonitis, myocarditis, hypothyroid, and adrenal insufficiency, all as potential 
side effects um, of uh, reactions to pembrolizumab. Uh, we learned that IRAEs can happen up to one year post-treatment, that uh, second IRAE is more common after a first, and that people are more likely to have multiple if they've already had one. Um, we learned uh, about the process of diagnosing an IRAE, specifically in the myocarditis and pneumonitis realms. We learned their diagnosis of ex exclusion, um, some of the criteria for diagnosis, um, and uh, that uh, trial for, for therapy with high-dose steroids can uh, potentially be efficacious. And then finally, we talked about uh, pleural effusions. So uh, looking for malignancy, empyemas, so on and so forth. Um, on a sample, we learned about the predictive value of a low pleural fluid pH as being predictive for empyema. And then um, just because we talked about it so many times, I've included Light's criteria here for your reference, um, one of which being positive indicates an exudative effusion. Incredible, Makund. You captured all of that so, so well. Thank you so much. Um, all right. Well, that uh, that is the end of the discussion. So thank you, everyone, for tuning in. And a huge shout out to Laura and Bipul for your really phenomenal uh, teaching in today's session. All right. Take care, everyone. We'll see you next time. Thank you again for having us. It was great. Thanks for coming. See you. It was great. Thanks.